Hello and welcome everybody to the first in a new series I'm hoping to develop where I talk to other artists about their creative processes, their inspirations, and their journeys to get where they are today. My name is Eric Bates and in this episode I'm talking with Kyle Driggs and I think you're really going to love hearing about how he made his award-winning ring and umbrella juggling act, what he calls his three pillars that make up a good juggler, and stick around because at the end he tells some amazing stories of moments he had in Iceland and in Japan that have inspired the work he is striving to create with his company, 3AM Theater. I hope you enjoy it. I'm talking to Kyle Driggs today. He is a gold medal winner at IJA, silver medal at Cirque de Demain. He worked on Queen of the Night with the Seven Fingers, Paramour on Broadway with Cirque du Soleil, toured on a variety of shows with Jay Gilligan, and is the co-founder of 3AM Theater. Did I miss anything? I think that's about it, man. <laughs> Nice. Well, I just wanted to say right off the bat that I've always been really impressed by the aesthetics and poetry of your work. And it seemed to me, looking at your Instagram and your costumes and your quality of movement in your acts, that you really take care to infuse everything you do with a deliberate decision process and an attention to detail that I think is really stunning. So I'm excited that we get to dive into some of what goes on behind the curtain to make that happen today. Yeah, for sure, for sure. So I guess my first question is just what is your creative process like? Where do you start when you're making, I guess you can talk about either new material, juggling or an act or a show. Where do you start? Yeah. Um, I think first and foremost, uh, most of most of the ideas I have or the work I like to make, it, it starts really with a visual image. I'm such a visual person. I really never use words very much uh, in, in my day-to-day -day life or even in, I don't write a lot in the work I make. I really try to get inspired by and I feed off of visceral images. And I think in general that, that stems from an interest in the fact that images, I, I feel are timeless in a way. And I feel it's not talking about something specific that quite often language does or words do and because of that a lot of the things that i'm attracted to or i gravitate to are timeless sentiments or aesthetics or things that are not necessarily pertaining to an exact moment of time so i think I'll, right off the bat a lot of the stuff that i gravitate towards or i'm interested in or i want to know more about are usually fundamental ideas or human principles or like timeless aesthetics or things that are kind of exist in the world that are not specifically talking about one specific thing. So I think that's just a general kind of MO about who I am as a person, I would say. And then after that, it's just what particular facet of life or anything really that I'm interested in about the work I'm making. Would you say you're trying to say something specific or you're just interested in pure imagery or you're using images as a tool to talk about a specific idea that you do have in your head? I think at times like I want to talk about a specific idea or concept, but I never want to walk on a stage and be like, this is a man who, you know, his pet just died and now he's getting into his car and going on to work and it's Friday, May 20th. Like, I never want to be that specific about stuff. I'm just not interested, really. Like, I like to let my imagination really dictate a lot of those things. So I find the more specific I get about certain things, the less I can use my imagination. But with that being said, I like to provide a, a framework or a set of parameters or some kind of structure that my imagination or the audience's imagination could perhaps work in. So you get a sense of, oh, this is this frame of mind or this invisible container, if you will, of ideas that, that I, he's working in. And me, as well as the artist, we can explore that container together, but I'm not specifically pinpointing on one thing. Can you elaborate on that, on yeah. that framework? Like maybe yeah. in, in one of your acts that you've made? The piece that I've explored the most is the graduation piece I made during uh, school at ENC. Uh, that, that piece is called ENSO, E-N-S-O. And that piece is specifically talking about a Japanese calligraphy concept. It's a Zen concept, so it's pertaining to Zen in, in Buddhism. And the painter, what he'll do is he'll take a brush and dip his brush in the ink 
and go onto his canvas and make a circle in one stroke. And so basically the ink touches the canvas, he or she does uh, the gesture of the Enso and then removes it. And that's all they can do or touch on the canvas. And I was really inspired by that idea because at first I was intrigued like, oh, is the is the intent to make a perfect circle and it's like a daily practice to like make it perfect but it's actually not that at all. It's really about the frame of mind and what it represents. And it's kind of like a visual representation of a, of a meditation. So if you meditate or if you have a certain frame of mind, you, there's no visual remnants of that. It's really just the, the visceral experience that you live in. But I, I believe that the Enso is kind of like a visual trace or I don't want to use the word evidence, but it's kind of like visual representation of that state of mind and I really really gravitated towards that idea because it could mean so many things to so many people and be different for so many people and yet it was like this universal concept of this state of mind and what it represented and I love the fact that it really represents the void and all the things in the world that are super unknown and the things that are beyond human comprehension and also all the interior simplistic states of being that a human can live in. It's like this really minimal and maximal pull towards these two levels of understanding. And I just found that to be so representative of the human experience. And then I found a lot, a lot of similarities with juggling and just how over time it felt like, oh, my juggling's really slowing down and I feel gravity in a weird way. And that feels like a meditation. And it, I found all these links and parallels that I found really interesting. The, the concept of Enso like a container. And I, my act was about that. And I never really performed that act the same way, but it's still playing inside of that container. Yeah, that's super interesting because all we have to know the soul of a thing is our visual or the way we receive it through our eyes and ears and, and senses, basically. So how do you how do you make choices still in this idea of Enso of what to add or what to remove or or what to juggle? Well, I guess to start, there is, for those that know or don't know, I guess there is this core kind of defined juggling props that we can use. So there is this base value of apparatus and objects that most jugglers in one way or another either start or gravitate towards and at some point in their study, and those of course are balls, rings, and clubs. And these are hundreds and if not thousands of years of, of time has been put into these shapes. So. Already, there's an enormous amount of history behind me in terms of shape choices and structure and research in those mediums. And I think for Enso in particular, it's kind of a no-brainer to pick circles because the Enso itself is a circle and I think a circle represents infinity and it's so representative of like what this container was talking about. So that was kind of a no-brainer for me. I chose to use larger circles, not only so I use these rings that are a little bit larger than normal rings uh, and they're by a juggling company called Renegade and they're 19 inches and they're hollow in the middle. So they're very, I would say, unconventional juggling rings uh, for a juggling standpoint, but they're so big and they're so visual and they, they, they have unique properties. Like they can bounce on the floor and I can roll them on my back and do a lot of these rolling type tricks, but I can also do like six and seven technique with it. And they're not too big where I couldn't do that. So they were like this sweet middle place. So I think choosing those rings as base juggling props for the piece was kind of a no brainer. But then the really exciting part of my own research and my own work was incorporating umbrellas. And the umbrella was definitely something that came in as a separate prop and had its own field of study. Oh, what can I do with the umbrella with it closed, with it open? What can I do with the umbrella with the rings open and closed? What can I do with three umbrellas? All this material just presented itself. So one step at a time, you know, developed more and more and more into something. And it's also changed through the years a lot too. Like it's, it's a bit like being a detective. You just keep finding stuff. I'm sure, I mean, every juggler I'm sure experiences this, but you just keep discovering, you know, you, you get really curious about one nuance of an idea and it digs you deeper and deeper and deeper. And then maybe there's gold in that. And then you find this trick or this movement pattern or flight pattern of the object that's new and exciting to you. And then you put it on stage and then you let the audience, you know, tell you if it, if it's good or not. 
how has your process evolved from, because you started playing with umbrellas before you went to Montreal Circus School. You still use them. I mean, that's that's a long time to juggle umbrellas. How has that changed for you? Before I went to school, I mean, I was really influenced by three jugglers, I would say. I would say Greg Kennedy, Sean Blue, and Peter Davison. And for me, for me, those three jugglers represented three really, really strong, beautiful areas of research. Those three jugglers in particular in my earlier years, I've collaborated with and, and were kind of coaches or if not mentors. But I, I think my process before school was really having those three areas of interest that those three jugglers passed on to me. Sean definitely gave me a strong sense of unique techniques because Sean is really, really good at very, very specific, unique juggling techniques and also a very high level of technique. Greg, I, I would say, it has a very strong process in creating new juggling ideas and apparatuses and what what is it to not use those three standard shapes that every juggler does. And Peter Davidson really showed me the power of movement and dance combined with juggling and what type of expression really lies in, in the Venn diagram of those two forms. So I was kind of going into school with the three of them kind of imprinted in my mind okay, this is a complete juggler if you can have areas of all three of these things. So I kind of distilled that to going into school thinking, okay, I'm just going to work with the rings and umbrellas because three years is probably the minimum amount of time it's going to take to really make something true to me, but also highly investigated as well. How can I move with the rings and umbrella? How can it be a super high level of technique? And what can I invent with these objects that's new and something exciting? So those were like the three... I guess ideas of process that were going into my mind. But before and after that, I have like a million things in, in notebooks of just other ideas that maybe didn't receive as much time and some of those I dabbled with before school. And I guess now after all these years, six or seven years after school is like when I'm finally revisiting some of those ideas, which is really exciting to be at that stage in my career. But in terms of the rings and umbrellas specifically, which at the moment I would say is kind of my signature, that that's where the process stemmed from. And in terms of how it changed, oh man, so many things. Getting out in the world, traveling, meeting people from different cultures, getting shows under your belt. Man, when you, yeah, I mean, you know, when you perform something a hundred times, it's different from when you were going into the, that first show. So bringing that material on stage that many times, knowing how the audience reacts, knowing how light hits the, the, the tricks at different angles, knowing all these details, it's kind of like an obsession. It's like a fine art study of like, man, there's so many elements to discover. And as soon as you think you figured it out, something new comes along. And not to mention the fabrication of the umbrellas changed, the types of umbrellas I used. And as those went through evolutions over the years, the tricks that became possible and the tricks that were no longer possible changed. I could try really, really hard to control all those things, but I think as it pertains to the Enso and the idea and the philosophy of the act, it's just evolving with time. And, I, and that's what I really like about it is that it changes whether I want it to or not. And I just ride the wave of those changes. And how do you adapt? Like you've performed in Big Apple Circus, you've been in a Broadway show and in Queen of the Night, you had this really poetic kind of closing act. Yeah. How do you, how do you take the material that you have and and change it or let the show change it or evolve yeah. it to suit the new purpose yeah man i think about this all the time i'm like how the hell am i going to take this <laughs> the same routine from this one show and someone's hiring me for the same material but not the same such a fine line between performing it the same way and doing the same tricks but making it work in a totally different context and I've stemmed that down like most circus artists who have experience in doing this in terms of performing a piece in many different ways or a a an aesthetic or a signature thing that's keeping the, the beats of the piece, the landmarks of the piece, like the, 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 the tricks, the signature moments of happenings in the routine. And then it's really about the moments of transition and the in-between moments that are up for grabs and open to interpretation. So that's really where I start. It's like, okay, here's this basic formula of this thing that I've developed and that's the bones. But then outside of that, there's all the organs and all this other, the, the blood and all this other stuff. Let's change that for each, 
performance or let's examine that even on a day to day within Big Apple. You know, I know I'm working in one type of version of the act, but even within that, I have room for play. And I think that's the only thing that can keep it interesting. Otherwise, you're just literally repeating the same set of actions over and over and over again. On your website or your Instagram, you describe yourself as a dancer as well as a contemporary circus artist. Yeah. Movement and dance was one of the one of your three kind of pillars that you brought to the school when you first started thinking about your practice. How has that evolved? Because you're also working sure. with a dancer in 3 a.m. theater. Yeah. Well, I definitely, you know, I've gone through so many waves uh, of movement. You know, I think when I was in school, I was really into ideas of flooring and, and, and flow. And some of that stems from like David Zambrano. And some of that is, stems from European type movement that's a little more acrobatic or a little bit more, how can I go to the floor and slide on my knee and turn around and, you know, have these pastures and things like that. And then I went through a huge phase after school where I was like, oh man, I never want to do this type of movement again. I'm just so uh, ready for something else and something different. And around that time is when I moved to New York City and really diving into a little bit of American dance, but a little bit of like New York City specific dance. And then a little bit of specifically what the company uh, Punch Drunk was doing. Like a lot of, and they do a show in New York City called Sleep No More. And that really opened my eyes to a whole other style of movement which was so much more theatrical so much more about intention and so much more about the surfaces or the site specific room or space you're working with and i really like that because it wasn't just about finding unique pathways and patterns it suddenly there was a reason and an intention for movement and it had it incorporated objects and structures and furniture and surface so as a juggler, I instantly connected with that to want to have a relationship with the space around me in, in, a, in a more intent kind of way. And then through that process, I met my partner, Andrea, who is a dancer, and we started 3AM Theater together. And she used to dance with the Martha Graham Dance Company. And then diving into the world of Graham and everything that is, it really opened my eyes to a whole new phase of movement and a whole new style of movement which is so full of depth and so full of deep deep intention which not only relates to a simple theatrical scene but can relate to something as deep as mythology and greek gods and they're moving from this place of power and this really really beautiful thought process uh, behind all the movements instead of oh i'm gonna roll on the ground and do cool intricate pathways and I'm not saying all movement on the ground is that but I guess that that was my experience of it for a long time and I got really bored of it and then I found something with a little bit more depth or a little bit more direction behind it for me that I connected to and that was really exciting to go through that shift how do you balance the movement and the juggling are there things that you have to sacrifice one or the other in order to accomplish both well, obviously, there's so many juggling figures or ideas or patterns that I can do that force me to stand there and focus on that pattern. And that's the only thing my body can do because it's so technically difficult. And then there's movement pathways or choreography or flow ideas or just, yeah, movement flight patterns that you can do that oh man, how, how am I supposed to juggle with this? <laughs> and then it you know can become a challenge of dissecting that and breaking it down. But I guess, I mean, to start with, like anybody, I think I find what's comfortable for me through improvisation, through recording and watching it, through interpretation of all sorts of things into choreography. So you just devise a whole lot of stuff there's automatically, I think, going to be stuff that feels better than other stuff. And then from there, you can choose to continue with it, take it further, or investigate it more. But it all stems back to what feels good in the body, and then continuing with that, and then things get developed. And then you find ways to make it harder, or you find ways to like be uncomfortable in the body, and then you iron through that, and then eventually make it comfortable. What are you working on now? What does 3AM Theater do? Yeah. So now now we're working on a, an evening length show called Eventide. And we've been working on it on and off for like three years now. 
which is crazy, but it's revealing so much about Andrea and myself, like our process and how we create things, the, the time it, we like to spend, where we're coming from, what our goals for the piece are, are we trying to break certain conventions? It just feels like we keep going, like it's like this dance you have to do. It's like, how deep do you want to go? And then at some point you actually have to make the thing and release the thing. All of our attention, I would say, is going into this, this piece. And there's so many layers to it that we keep feeling like, oh, I want to get to this place before we're ready to present it. Oh, like that needs to get to this. And, you know, it, it, basically the show has gone through like three different versions or two by now and maybe by this summer or who knows with COVID. The third iteration will be ready. But I mean, it started super bare bones. I think a lot of shows go through this. It started super bare bones. And then the next version we did on a, a lot bigger of a stage and we had more of a set. And then the third version is kind of the maximal, like, oh man, what if we had all the bells and whistles, every dream we wanted, uh, it, it looked and felt exactly like what we wanted, what would that be? And I think now we're in the process of building that, which is super cool. What are, what are some of the ways that you guys make material? Well, I guess a huge learning curve for our, Andrea and I was how do we even approach working together? Because Andrea doesn't have or she didn't have when we started a super large circus background and I didn't have the level of dance background that she had, uh, you know, as a, as a Graham and Sleep No More dancer. So it was almost like inevitably there had to be this learning curve or this period of time that we went through just to speak the same language. And then it was like, okay, it, you know, just identifying like, oh, okay, Andre, it's gonna be really necessary for you to learn X, Y, and Z to like round out elements in the show and okay Kyle if you want to be at the same level and so, as some of my movements you got to do this this and this so it was just kind of identifying what work needed to be done for us to make the show in our wildest dreams to look and feel like what we wanted it to and I would say that's kind of a never-ending process but we're very much further along in that process than when we started the piece and now I would say we're like 75% there the, the rest is just refinement but like Andrea learned hair hanging and a little bit of trapeze and I am making this super physical piece on a treadmill and all these new ideas came out and like I'm making this ball piece, all, all these things came about. And then this whole technical thing revealed itself. We're inventing all these new apparatuses and all these apparatuses have to go through prototypes and then refinement phases and then you need the money to build the actual thing and then it's like all these monetary costs so it's really just chipping away at this thing like one freaking step at a time but it takes a long time for sure oh absolutely and it makes me think you said when you were going into school i want to make an act with rings and umbrellas and it's going to take me three years to really explore this thing and now you're trying to make a whole show just in terms of a, a five minute act to a show that's going to take you 30 years at that rate how do you how do you balance that? Well, I guess first and foremost, like all the work I'm super inspired by takes a super long time. Uh, and I, and that just happened to be what I noticed in, in the observations of the work that I saw. Also, what I noticed in, in other people that I really admire their process, they have a, a list of uh, or a group of collaborators that they work very closely with for a long time. And with that, you really develop working relationships that are beyond, hey, I have this idea, can you build it for me? All right, here's a check, like really great working with you. It's like much deeper than that. I think that is where true investigation and true discovery lie in that time commitment that you spend with a collaborator. And it's never, I mean, it's never easy. You know, if we're working, traveling the world, doing projects left and right to keep consistent people in our life, so I guess part of my transition has been doing less of that busy touring life and like staying in, in one place to try and build a set of collaborators that I can do multiple things with and I start understanding their mind and they understand mine a bit more because better stuff comes out if you have the right collaborator. And I noticed all the people that I thought were making really great work had a similar setup. I looked at the credit list for the work and at the same five or six people for almost every piece. And I'm like, oh, there's a... There's something very revealing about that. So that helps like the time process. Then you don't have to do, I mean, you have to delegate, obviously. You can't do everything yourself. It's just crazy. Yeah, I mean, other than that, it's like 
15, 16 hour days, <laughs> you know, just like you got to make time for training. You got to research new stuff. You got to build new stuff. You got to pay the bills. You got to do all the things all the time. And that usually equates to like super freaking long days, you know? But I'm wondering what advice to yourself you would have had back when you were first starting. I guess just trust the process. Like you can't, you can't skip ahead chapters. I guess I was so desperate to just skip ahead of the steps. And I wish I spent more time on, like everyone's on a timeline, you know, of process, whether it be creative or life or technique or whatever. It's like you're on a predetermined process. And yeah, you can train really hard and you can stay up 20 hours a day working on something. And that's going to fast forward it a bit. But life is going to play its course no matter what. And you can never change that. So just give the present moment that you're in the fullest amount of attention and care and I wished my older self could have told that to my younger self to just trust where you're at and keep going and work hard every day of course is there anything else you would really want to say about creativity or process <laughs> or inspiration that I didn't didn't get to yeah. touch on I'm really into science fiction and I would love to see more science fiction or larger concepts explored in circuits. Really? And I, I think that's where, yeah, that, I think that's where I'm diving into now and I'm, I'm, I'm finding so many fascinating things right now. And yeah, I, like I think science fiction is one of those beautiful forms that's often misunderstood or often labeled like, oh, only the geeks like science fiction and like, I get that and that's cool. But at the same time, there's so much, not only visual innovation, but also philosophical, analytical innovation that happens in science fiction. And they often, a good piece of science fiction will integrate both, right? And I'm like, man, it'd be so cool to see more circus work doing this. What would that even look like? <laughs> I don't know, man. I, I think it's more, I mean, it's definitely more visual heavy work for sure. Like you can't. I, don't, I think it's super hard to pull off good science fiction work in a black box theater with no set, right? A lot of time in the in the set and the lighting and how everything works and interacts with together and the costumes that are important. Like, and that's just like the visual layer. But then how does the thematic and the writing layer support all of that? And how do the two of those forces work together? And I think a lot of the, the names that I've been fascinated with these days contributed to that, that genre, mostly in the film department like on, on movies and stuff like it'd be really cool to have a circus company that's a visual effects company and they make i guess circus kind of like that but yeah like how innovative was like 2001 space odyssey or star wars when that came out in the 70s some of the visual effects people had never seen before and there was whole departments of people working on that stuff it'd be great if like i guess cirque cirque is like one of the closest things that has that but there's a couple of places that in france uh, like I think the guy's name is Raphael Navo. He's doing a lot with like Magie Nouvelle and visual effects. And I think that's one of the, the closer categories of like a circus special effects company. But if he's just so cool to push the visual mediums forward, not just the technical mediums. And I think that's what I'm super interested in at the moment. Do you have any big flashes of inspiration that you remember, like seeing someone or a book that you read or a movie that you saw or something that really you know, screwed your head on a different way. Probably one of my best friends, Jay Gilligan. Uh, he's a great modern contemporary juggler, contributed so much to the field of study of juggling. He has so many students and he's just such a, a great um, guiding force in, in the art of juggling. We toured Iceland together every summer for like five years. And we, we kind of just had zero preconceived notions of what we were going to do. We just kind of took a plane to Iceland and figured it out as we went. But they have this thing in, in Iceland, I don't know if it still exists, but uh, you can take a tour inside of a volcano. So basically there's like this dormant volcano and you can take a scissor lift down to the bottom and it's, I don't know how many hundreds of feet in the air. It's like really tall, it's pretty sketchy, it's pretty scary actually. And you submerge down into this big empty dark volcano. And they have a bunch of like, lights set up so you can kind of explore the surface and you can see the side walls and everything. So we did that and we brought a bunch of juggling props down with us. We knew, we, we got to know the owner and he let us in for free at night uh, when the last group was going so we could stay longer. And we, we kind of got like a performer uh, pass, if you will. So we brought some props down to do some filming. 
and then we were chilling down there and then another elevator came down and it was like a i think it was for national geographic or like some pretty significant camera crew was there and with them they were filming not only the interior of the crater but they had one of uh Iceland's uh, most famous folk singers with them and she was with them and she came down and she sang a song inside the volcano and her voice was like from another planet so beautiful and the way it reverberated inside the volcano was crazy and it just became this super surreal out-of-body experience we're inside of this volcano this woman is singing this ethereal magic and it's one of the deepest connections to earth that i've ever felt like I, th that was one of the more visually and viscerally powerful moments of my life there's plenty others of course but i think that's like the first one that stands out as like oh my god i'll never forget this There's a lot of small ones that maybe aren't as epic. The time of day that the sun is passing by a certain window and it moves light across the space and the whole space gets darker, but this one body of light comes in. And those are the small moments that life can treat you with. Things like that I'm really drawn to. I find just a lot of inspiration in those haphazard visual phenomenon moments or like, oh, it's raining, but you can kind of see a mirage in the background. Little stuff like that I totally go crazy off of because I love them so much. Maybe some people listening to this or not may know a pretty great circus artist named Guillaume Koshwa, and he, he's a very close friend of mine, and we went to Japan uh, together twice, actually, but the first time we went, we went to Kyoto, and we got super lost deep in the woods of Kyoto, and totally off the beaten path, and we were in thick bamboo forest, no map, no cell phone service, totally not wanting to know where we were, just getting super lost. And we found this little shrine built in the forest and it was filled with lit candles and golden Buddha. We just stopped for a second. Like it literally took us out of our tracks and out of our human experience. And we saw this thing and we both looked at each other and like two minutes, we didn't say anything to each other. And we were just feeling the air and the thickness and the purity of that moment. And the tears came to our eyes and it was like, this other dimension stuff in life is so real. I love whenever that happens in life because that takes us so far out of our human experience and reminds us of something so much greater that we can't see, smell, feel, or touch, but we know is there. And, you know, a lot of people have a lot of different interpretations for what that is, but I just love when you viscerally feel it and, and experience it. And it was one of those moments for sure. My goal is to recreate those types of experiences on stage using lighting and sound and costume and design. Obviously, it's hard to really emulate what you get from, from nature or out in the world by happenstance. But I think one of the most beautiful things in theater and certain types of theater is when it can it create those moments. And it can create these magical, visceral, visual phenomenon experiences where you literally get transported to not just another place in your imagination where you think about something. It's just like the beats of time in your human experience stutter or skip like on a record. Those moments. And those are so devoid of narrative. Those moments are so hard. How can you frame a moment like that in, in a story? It just, it happens. It, you know, to anybody at some random time. It's like your record skips in your life. I'm interested in creating that experience. And that experience is really hard to talk about, to recreate or to even relate to all the time. But I know it's this universal truth that everyone has at the end of the day. <laughs> Taking it deep. <laughs> as soon as you summarize that, because you have to in three sentences in a program, it sounds super lame, right? But the visceral experience of going through it is not lame. So it's like the work can speak for itself. It's just talking about it in words or even as we're doing now, ah, man, it's so hard. It's just like, turn all the lights off and create a, a, a crazy shadow through your window. And it, you know, that's why we call our company 3 a.m. theater because at that time of night, it's like the portal of time where that type of stuff is possible to happen because it's late enough where you can't really, like you're in a different state of reality, usually at 3 a.m. in one form or another, right? You're not, unless you're like a nighttime worker or something, usually your perspective of reality is pretty skewed at 3 a.m. And most times visually it's pitch blackout and any source of light or sound you hear is gonna have a sensory effect on you a lot differently than 95% of the other time in your life. For me, it was like a no brainer. Oh yeah, 3 a.m. theater. Our work talks about this experience. Yes.
Yeah, that's a good name. That's a better name than Barcode. <laughs> nah, dude. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's nice to hear you try to explain it. I think yeah. successfully. It's exciting for me too to talk about it because I, I feel like I'm at this place where each passing day things are becoming more and more clear and I'm getting more and more confident to be like, yeah, you know what? This is what it is. This is who I am. This is what I'm about. And that that's a new evolution or a new step maybe from Enzo or this one thing that I did for so long. I felt like the like I'm trying to get out of just being the umbrella guy. And I know like I am that in a way. But I'm so excited to release a whole large body of work and I'm so eager to see how it's going to be received from people. Because I have so many other ideas that I'm so excited to show people. Ah uh, man, there's so many things I haven't posted on Instagram or social media or made videos of that I want to show and I want to release, but I'm just playing the patience game. I'm going to drop all of this stuff in a trailer and it's going to be great because it's all going to be compiled instead of random bits and pieces on Instagram stories. Like that's so, it's so tempting to do it, I'll tell you. Yeah. The payoff is that people know the Umbrella Guy and know all the time into that and that concept, and they're gonna want to see all the other stuff when it finally comes out. I know I do. <laughs> yeah, and there's these artists like Camille Boitel and Joan Le Guillaume and people like this that have no presence online. They don't release work super often. But when they do, it's like, you remember it. Le Mediat is like one of the greatest shows I've ever seen in my life and I'll never forget it. I saw it and the only memory I have of it is a program. Like that's the only thing I keep. I cherish that, like this personal artifact in a way because it was this thing that I'll never forget and all I'm left is with these vivid fragments of it. And, it, and I feel like it would take away if I could just go online and watch the whole thing. On essaye d'être le plus vague possible parce que nous, ce qu'on préfère presque avec les spectacles, c'est le, enfin, le, le, le rôle du spectateur, le, la, la, le, le parfait spectateur, ce serait celui qui sait rien du tout et qui, euh, et qui euh, reçoit tout de, de ce qui se passe directement. But not everything should be like that. That would be a shame if all great movies you could only watch once. But I think for shows, that's the best way to experience them. You know, it's like, ah oh, man, you only get to see this live. That's it. <laughs> Just to throw two other names that are very much in my spotlight right now, James Terrell and Douglas Trumbull are two of the biggest ones right now in this specific moment of time. Those are the two people I'm freaking out about. Where can people find you if they want to learn more about your juggling and 3AM theater? Yeah, at the moment we're not as active as we should be on social media, but yeah, we have an Instagram called 3AM at 3AM theater. And theater is spelled the European way, so R-E instead of E-R. And uh, we're redoing our website, so you can't find us on our website yet, which is fine. Everything has its own process, I guess, right? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and um, we release visuals for the show Eventide intermittently, where we want to get to the point where we're like, okay, the show's done. Now we're going to release a, a, a ton of visuals in the world. We're definitely waiting for that day. But I guess I'm really using this quarantine time to just dive into the work and not try so much to release stuff in this time. I'm using this more as like studio time because I think it's really precious time to have. My personal Instagram is just a juggler and you can see some of the loose fragments of stuff I'm working on there. But yeah, I mean, there'll be more to come in the future, I I'm sure. Thanks so much for doing this with me. Yeah, dude. Yeah, of course, man. It's a pleasure. And if you want to ask me anything else, just give me a call.